Somehow, all of a sudden, I found myself in a very difficult situation because I, I didn't know what to do. I was uh, being violated. I, 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 I just froze. I didn't have the empowerment. I didn't feel like I could say no because he was older. That was childhood thinking. And I had to learn when I was a child, I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. But now that I'm an adult, I need to put childish ways behind me. Welcome to Pure Passion. My name is Colette Burcue, and I'm your host for today's program. One of the greatest tragedies of our modern era is the explosion of child abuse that has been taking place throughout the world. Whether for lust or money, a significant percentage of the population thinks that it is okay to sexually abuse children. It is a form of cultural insanity that is continuously being fed by media moguls whose lust for more has no boundaries and by their customers who mindlessly feed on their poisonous fare. One victim of such abuse is June Hunt, well-known author and host of the nationally syndicated radio program, Hope for the Heart. Let's watch as June shares her story of abuse and the wisdom gained in finding healing through Jesus Christ. I grew up in an immoral home. Uh, where we were a family off on the side. And uh, my dad was married to someone else and I uh, found out actually there was even another family. So there were three families uh, that he fostered. And uh, I remember one time being um, in a room and there was a cousin there. And somehow, all of a sudden, I found myself in a very difficult situation because I, I didn't know what to do, but uh, I was uh, being violated. I, 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 I just froze as though I did not have any knowledge of anything happening. And it, I never told anyone. Uh, it happened again. And it happened again because, and then I finally realized if I'm alone with him, I need to find a way to not be alone. And, but, you know, nobody told me what to do. I, I, this had never even been verbalized. When the abuse was taking place, uh, it was gradual. It moved from just simple doing something wrong with my clothes, why was, why was he touching my clothes? Why was he unzipping my zipper? All I could think of is, what, what do I do? I can't do anything. I assumed I could do nothing. And I, all I can remember thinking is, I've got to act like I don't know what's going on because I don't know what to do, so I acted like I was fixated on this television. And I fixated on it so that I appeared, I thought, to just not know anything that's happening. And then again, when it occurred again, I thought, oh no, I'm in this situation again. And, and I, I found myself uh, feeling frustrated that this, I knew it shouldn't be going on, but I didn't have the empowerment. I didn't feel like I could say no because he was older. You know, children are told, obey your elders. Obey your elders. Uh, and, that, and an elder can be somebody who is a year older, six months older. Now, he was older than that, but... It never dawned on me that I should have told. 
all I can remember feeling is powerless. Most people aren't aware that the brain doesn't actually become fully developed until age 25. So the rational, logical thought process is not typically a part of a child's thinking. Uh, they can be trained mechanically to do things and need to be, but it's only later that uh, more abstract thinking or uh, where children uh, growing up, they learn uh, how to think more logically and uh, based on cause and effect. Um, it's a wonderful time to help children learn what, is, what the boundary needs to be. You are never to allow anyone to touch you in the area covered by your bathing suit. Uh, if somebody tries to touch you, then you leave, you scream, you run. There are practical things to do. But in truth, most parents, they themselves were never told that. And so they did not know how to have boundaries. But I thought about this over the years, realizing that I would find myself in powerless situations when I really wasn't powerless. I actually had the power to stop certain things happening in, in just my everyday relationships. I'm talking about where I would allow a friend to be abusive toward me verbally. And I would have other people say, why are you responding this way? Why, why don't you, why do you let someone hurt you like this? And I thought, I don't know. I mean, I, it's like I don't have a choice. That's what I thought. I don't have a choice. Well, that was childhood thinking. And I had to learn when I was a child, I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. But now that I'm an adult, I need to put childish ways behind me. I need to take responsibility to say no when I need to say no. And so I've learned this key point. At times you have to say no to a person so that you can say yes to God. A true victim is powerless. They don't have the ability to say no. Well, in a way, children don't have the skills in that respect, even though they can feel guilty. Say, why didn't I do something? Why didn't I tell? Why didn't I get up and leave? A child is very limited in an ability to know that they can do certain things that are actually right to do. So in truth, what I found was while I, by experience, felt I couldn't say no because I didn't have the skills to do it, I know that many, many, many people who have been victimized as children, they feel guilty. They feel oh, I'm at fault. Largely, it's because they are told, you wanted it. This is what you wanted me to do. You came to me, etc. No, children don't do that. That's on the part and in, in the mindset of the perpetrator who plans and repeatedly plans uh, how to get entree to that child. And this is why it's all important to empower children with the ability to say no to unwanted touch, to wrong touch. There's another issue that is so helpful to relieve a child, an adult child, who's saying, I don't understand. I... I I feel so bad. And what they feel bad about is because they physically felt pleasure. They physically responded. If that's you, you need to understand that God created your physical body to respond if stimulated in the sexual areas. That was his design. And it was designed for marriage. But when a perpetrator who knows what he or she is doing, counts on there to be pleasure. Well, understand, you know 
that you might be feeling something pleasurable, even though at times you may think, but I'm really not supposed to be doing this. But again, the body was created by God. Your body was doing what it's supposed to do, and that is responding to sexual touch for the purpose of responding in marriage. This is not an area where you are to feel guilty. In fact, that would be called false guilt. When there is self-hatred, there needs to be a redirecting of that. It is right to hate evil and say, what happened to me was evil. But thank you, God, that I am not evil and you don't see me as evil. Instead, that you see what happened to me is something that you hated and that I can hate what's happened. And yet you also give me hope. In Jeremiah 29, 11, the Lord says, I know the plans I have for you, plans to prosper you, not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. So regardless of the past, there may need to be healing, and that healing is important. But He has hope for you. He has a future for you. And that is His joy. So that no matter what the past is, you don't have to be a prisoner of your past. That's never His plan. Instead, you make peace with your past. You accept that the past will be in the past. But that God offers His hope for your future. One of the major questions that I hear is, how can a God of love allow a child to be abused? If God is a loving God, if He's all-powerful, why did He allow abuse? It's vital that we understand how God set up the world. First of all, the first two people that he put on earth, Adam and Eve, he told them something to do. He told them actually something not to do, and that is don't eat from this tree. What did they do? They ate from that tree. God gave everybody a capacity to go against his will, and every one of us have done it because the Bible says, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Well, the fact is, the way God set up the world, He gave us free will. That's important because free will assumes that people can go against His will, God's will. Why is this important as we talk about abuse? It's because God in His sovereignty, He allows us all to do things that are against His will. You see, He didn't make us as robots. There are times where God will literally calm the storm. That's what we call a miracle, as Jesus did. He calmed the storm. And there are other times where He will calm His child in the midst of the storm. The promise for us all is that as we yield our will to His will, He will give us a peace that passes all understanding. And what does He do when there has been abuse, knowing that He is against abuse, knowing that in the Bible He even forbids it? One thing you can know for sure, for every person who has been abused, he stretches our capacity for compassion so that then we can understand the pain of others and we can be not indifferent. We can have compassion where others might say, oh, bless your heart, honey. I'm so sorry that happened to you. Instead of sympathy, we can have empathy. We can feel what another person is going through. And we can have active compassion where we enter into that person's world, the one who has been abused, and we can say, I'll stick here until the hurt is gone. When a child has been abused, realize we're talking about a boundary that's been crossed. 
A boundary is a line that should not be crossed, and yet when that sexual boundary is crossed, there is an effect. Uh, for many, especially girls, uh, they can become promiscuous. Number one, they feel, well, what I was saving myself for, my virginity is lost. It doesn't matter anymore. Especially, they can feel, ah, this is what brings pleasure. So this is what I'm supposed to do. If I am dating, I must give sex because that's the payoff for what I've been uh, given. I was given dinner. Um, we went to a movie, went to the theater. And, and so this is what I'm owed. Well, that's not true. Uh, the problem is, yes, if there was childhood sexual abuse, then the boundary was crossed, but you are seen as precious in the eyes of God. And instead of being promiscuous, uh, often it goes either a person becomes promiscuous or very frigid. Instead, you just maintain the boundary and say what was done was wrong. That was not what God wanted to happen. And so I have been given the opportunity to actually be healed. Uh, God is my healer. And I'm learning who is trustworthy and who is not. And you pray that he will give you discernment so that when you see someone, and often you can see it in the eyes of someone, you can see when a person is moving from just a positive uh, interest and attraction to working ways to be more sexually invasive and that stimulation, they're aiming toward that, um, this is where you put up a boundary and you say, no, any, anything that is beyond uh, the area covered my, by my bathing suit, I'm not going to allow that kind of touching. And I'm even going to be careful in the way that I'm kissed. I'm responsible for my response. I cannot help what happened in the past. I can't change the past. But I can make healthy choices now about the future. That was then, this is now. That was then, this is now. And no matter what I've done since then, whether it's becoming promiscuous or not, today is a new day, and I have the choice to make right decisions now. And I'm choosing to be right in God's sight and pure before Him. Those who are caught in homosexuality, uh, if they struggle in this area, many times it's because when they were younger, they were sexually abused. And therefore, they do not trust males. Uh, even at our own ministry, uh, Hope for the Heart, in our first years, there was someone who uh, had been abused by her father and two brothers. Um, father first, and he would allow her to pick the instruments he would use on her. And then, uh, some choice, then her brothers realized what was going on in the other room and began to do the same. She was determined, I will not look attractive. So she began to wear overalls, like men's overalls. She became a welder. And when she came to Christ, she changed tremendously on the inside. She began to hear about the love of God for her. Uh, she began to understand that the truth sets you free, but she needed more truth, practical help to set her free. Now here's a five foot two, precious young woman who thinks, but I can't trust men, but I know that's wrong. And now she's hearing a whole different approach where anybody can be a perpetrator. Everybody is not a perpetrator. There are godly, godly men that you can trust with your life. 
And the bottom line is I watched this transformation of a young woman who got into homosexuality because she thought she couldn't trust any male. And yet to watch her blossom and literally leave the vestiges of past mindsets that were actually wrong, she became victorious and began to lead a support group. The first time this church had ever had a support group for those who had been victims of childhood sexual abuse, she began to be used by God in a beautiful way to set others free. Two hours every evening, I do a call-in counseling program called Hope in the Night. On occasion, I will get a young man, person who has been in the lifestyle of homosexuality. I'll say, what was the first sexual activity that you can remember? What was your first sexual touch? With males in the homosexual world, I find that most often it's a male touching that boy at a very young age. And as such, there's an excitement, there's a feeling that God puts into all human beings in the sexual areas when they're touched there's a sense of pleasure. Is If we're talking about seduction, I'm not talking about rape, I'm talking about seduction. And when that boy feels this phenomenal sense of pleasure for the first time, it's like it implants in their brain this wonderful euphoric feeling. So they can think, oh, I must be a homosexual. Bottom line, we're talking about same-sex attraction because they're wanting to feel that feeling again. And they think it's natural, but that does not define any person when there is inappropriate touch. God designed the marriage relationship as a special time for sexual expression. And the way I would look at this is, since God forbids homosexuality, He would never, ever create you to be what He forbids. When there's been abuse, was especially childhood sexual abuse, which violates the very core of a person, yes, that is victimization. But the good part is you never have to stay a victim. In fact, there's a victim mentality of once a victim, always a victim. No, in the Bible we read, heal me, O Lord, and I will be healed. Save me and I will be saved. There's no one beyond his ability to give hope and help and literally save us from the pain of the past. Some people use the word you move from victim to be a survivor. Well, I actually think there's a better word. Uh, I think of a survivor as being basically washed up on shore, just uh, gulping, okay, I'm, I've survived. We are told in the Bible that we are more than conquerors, more than conquerors. We literally can be overcomers. And that means, yes, you may have been a victim, and you may have survived, but in Christ, you are an overcomer. And as such, you're given a precious ministry of compassion, of understanding, of being able to feel what another person feels, and then to be able to literally make the mess of your life your ministry. What a beautiful opportunity you have. There's nothing wasted when put into His hands. Indeed, in Christ you are more than a survivor. By His healing power, you can be an overcomer. You can be used by God to comfort the hearts of victims with the comfort that you have received from the Lord. And come back here next week where we'll have another example of how Christ can set anyone free from anything. 
I'm Colette Q for Pure Passion. Where the light is, God steps, I'm taking.